my first SciPy as well. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Brendan Hall, and I work at Nthought. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about a uh, software platform that's been developed there over the past few years for uh, processing and, and analyzing core CT data. So yeah, all the uh, software is dominantly written in Python using the Python ecosystem. And uh, before I get in too far, because I don't know if everyone in this room is geologist, usually I'm used to talking to crowds of geologists. I'm going to define what core I'm talking about and, and a little bit about what CT data is as well. So the core I'm talking about are earth core samples. Okay? So these are cylindrical sections of rock that are extracted from the earth during specialized drilling operations. So they use a special cylindrical hollow drill bit to drill down and uh, drills around sort of a rock sample that goes inside the hollow part of the drill bit and, uh, and they can extract it. And uh, this is typically done a lot in the oil industry. They want to characterize their oil reservoirs, but it's also done by the academic community. If they want to uh, study processes that made the Earth's crust, or as I'll talk about later, what happens to the Earth's crust when a huge meteor hits it and it all breaks up. So it's really one of the, uh, the only direct ways that geologists get to actually look at the rock that comes from these formations. Otherwise, they depend on a lot of remote sensing or indirect measurements like seismic data and well logs to, uh, to characterize the rock. But from having these actual samples from, from within their, their reservoirs or be able to look at the fractures and things, they can, they can do testing, they can send it to the lab, they can... Uh, this picture on the right-hand side there shows core laid out probably in a, in a, in a viewing room, a te huge temperature-controlled buildings. And geologists will scour along that with uh, microscopes and rulers and describe the beds and laminations and sedimentary structures that they see to try and characterize the depositional environment of the core and uh, to determine what uh, processes form that rock or you know, how much oil there might be if they're looking at an oil reservoir. And uh, it's become pretty common now to have CT scans done of these cores once they get extracted. So the image on the left-hand side there shows a core that uh, is being processed. This is actually a project we have going on right now with the University of Texas in Weatherford Lab. So that's actually a medical CT scanner that's showing there. So instead of a person kind of going through that opening, there's actually a, you know, a fixture for cores to be fed through. So what's going on with these CT scans is it's basically a three-dimensional X-ray. So instead of just a normal X-ray uh, source uh, shining radiation through a sample and being, it being measured from one position, the CT scanner measures it at a number of positions around the axis of the sample. And all of these images then can be taken and combined using reconstruction algorithms to come up with an image of the cross-section of that sample. Okay? The image of the cross section, basically the image amounts, uh, what, it's, what it's measuring is the uh, attenuation of the x-rays as it passes through. And that depends dominantly on the density of the material and also on the atomic number. So what you wind up with is a high resolution image about, uh, in a scanner like this, about 0.3 millimeters per pixel, uh, image of the texture and fabric of the sedimentary structure of the rock. So as the core is, is fed into through that opening, it takes a succession of these cross-sectional images that can be reconstructed then into, uh, into a three-dimensional volume that represents the core. So what's the purpose of this? So typical core description timelines is after the core gets extracted and it gets off the drilling rig and shipped to the labs and cut in half, the geologists finally get to look at it. So, but there's a long time delay there. And once they do look at it, it takes, you know, to, for large cores, a number of weeks before uh, they're done with their descriptions. And uh, once that's done, the senior geologist can take it and make his interpretations of the depositional environment and things like that. Uh, we're proposing uh, that uh, we can shorten those timelines. So CT data are normally taken fairly soon after the core is extracted, uh, while it's still encased and still intact, and before, oftentimes before plugs are taken. And this project actually began with uh, some geologists at Shell who were tired of this CT data kind of sitting dormant on the shelf, and they knew that it actually represented a lot of you know, information that could be mined for uh, more details on the core. So the purpose of this project then is to create that digital model and apply pattern recognition and machine learning algorithms then to just you know, do some descriptions of the core 
that could then be uh, later interpreted by geologists and perhaps even fed into more advanced algorithms like machine learning. So what this can also get around is the fact that these core descriptions aren't that repeatable, uh, or not necessarily that repeatable. You know, you might have a number of geologists working on the same core, each with their own description style. You might have geologists that, you know, are angry after lunch and do a different quality of description than they did before lunch. And, and you might have cores arriving months later that um, they'll describe and they'll do it differently than ones month before. So the effort is to come up with a system that allows these to, these, uh, this process to be repeatable. So the workflow I'm going to describe has two components. Uh, the first step, we call it clear core. That is uh, the step of taking the raw CT data, processing it, turning it into a 3D model, cleansing it and correcting it, removing some artifacts, and I'll talk more about that. And then using feature detection algorithms to, to describe it. So determine bedding patterns that are there, uh, lamination frequencies, uh, and fractures. And then virtual core is a name that kind of describes the, the, the end user application, but we, it's also the name we give to the entire project. But that's a uh, an visualization and analysis environment. So that takes the, uh, the CT data, presents it in nice 2D views, that you can view alongside well logs if you have them, high resolution core photographs, uh, and it also has um, a 3D visualizer so you can load up the volume of the core, and uh, I'll give a de demonstration of the app uh, and show you that in a moment. And also do uh, other analysis on the core as well, so uh, machine learning classification and depth shifting and aligning the core so that it uh, matches with uh, the way it was in the well bore. So the first processing step we do is we actually take all of those cross-sectional images. So uh, the raw data comes in in thousands of DICOM files. One DICOM file for every 0.3 millimeter slice, the axial slice of the core. So these cores typically come in about three foot sections, so that's about 3,000 files per section, and a typical core is, uh, that we see is about 300 feet, so 300,000 of these files, and it's in a format known as DICOM. DICOM's a medical CT image format, and it's pretty inconvenient to work with numerically. So we combine all those into a format that's convenient for scientific computation, and it just so happens in the Python community we have some very good formats for that, so we create 3D NumPy arrays and store it to disk uh, with HDF5. Uh, how much space a model would take up? One of these models would typically be for a 300-foot core would be on the order of hundreds of gigabytes. Okay. At the end, though, I'm going to talk about a core we're working on right now that's about four, five terabytes of data. So it depends on the length. Yeah. So the next, so once we have the raw data and we uh, have a, uh, it ingested in this three-dimensional format, we do some processing to remove artifacts and to clean it up. So I have a before and after image here of CT data. So the um, the uh, two-dimensional slice through the core, sort of on the top, and the axial slice on the bottom. And when these cores come to the scanning lab, they might be encased in different materials. So the example here, uh, the section on the top is encased in wax, and the section on the bottom is encased in aluminum. So they might encase it in wax if it has volatile chemicals in it, like hydrocarbons. They want to keep those intact to, measure, to um, do some testing on them in the lab. And they're very often encased in aluminum. This is a material that it's, they're used during drilling. And uh, let me pull my cursor up here. You can see there might be some mud residue left over uh, in those casings. There's obviously an offset between the, uh, the I call them the CT number, or the actual um, attenuation coefficient that is being visualized here. So yeah, a word on that. The lighter the, uh, it appears in the image, the more dense or the higher the CT number is. So those correspond to more dense features. So there's an offset here between these two just because of the material it was encased in. So we need to correct for that so that they're normalized so that, say, a rock that has the same type here and a rock that has the same type here will appear the same in the, in the final processed image. And we also remove artifacts, such as beam hardening. You can see in the image at the top, it's, it appears a bit brighter towards the edges of the image than it does in the center. That's due to the fact uh, that the um, low-frequency x-rays are absorbed more preferentially um, on the outside, and so we correct for that and normalize it across the cross-section there. And then mask out things like the tubing and the mud residue, so what you're left with is just a volume of rock material 
that um, can be used for analysis. And I mentioned before, uh, the application's uh, written primarily in Python uh, and using tools from the Python ecosystem. So, of course, SciPy, we're relying heavily on, on NumPy uh, for the representation of the data. Scikit-Image, we're using for a lot of the image processing, contrast enhancement, and also um, computing local binary patterns, which is a measure of texture that can be used for features for machine learning. Scikit-Learn for image classification. We're using uh, the random forest classifier from that, for example. Pandas, we're using to manage metadata for the project. I've talked about HDF5 and H5Pi we're using to, to store all the data. Uh, Network X, we're using to manage the, the flow of data through the processing algorithms. From the Mahotas Computer Vision Library, we're also using um, the Heralic feature uh, functionality as another measure of texture. And then, of course, the NThought tool suite we're also leveraging. So the platform, uh, the architecture of the UI and the, the plugin architecture is uh, through Envisage. And Chaco and Traits are also used heavily throughout the application. So once we've cleaned it up, we can detect some features. So here are some that we do. So we do a betting detection uh, on it. And we uh, look for changes in the average CT number. We do a change point detection algorithm to uh, define where um, the bed boundaries occur, looking for average density changes. Compute the lamination frequency, which are higher frequency uh, changes in the, uh, in the CT number. We also can compute the dip angle automatically using a dynamic time warping approach. And then we also look for, for fractures. In this case, we're showing parting fractures. These are sort of pancake-shaped sh uh, fractures that occur when the cord gets extracted. And all that overburden gets taken off the cord, tends to expand a bit, and these fractures appear. And the, uh, the density of those fractures actually gives you some indication of the mechanical properties of the rock. And, and drillers are very interested in knowing about that. So I'll skip to a live demo of the application now. Right, so this is virtual core. This is the, the viewer part of virtual core. And uh, the main part of the screen here shows a lot of the two-dimensional data displays and then some controls on the right-hand side to configure uh, what tracks are being displayed and uh, transverse axial cut wherever I draw my uh, mouse here is in the bottom right-hand corner. So the data that you bring in and import into the system can have their own depth scales. So if you take photographs and have CT data and well logs, they can all be associated with their own depth scales and matched up with, uh, with one another. These things can get shifted around a bit and errors can occur. So we have a tool to manage the relationships between those depth scales. You can see for this core here, here's a, a uh, section of the uh, two-dimensional section to the core. Uh, the bedding that was detected during the feature detection step. Here's uh, core photographs right here. These are high resolution core photographs that were taken in the lab. Once the core was uh, scanned, then it was cut down through the center, and they'll go and photograph it with really high resolution cameras. And uh, you can actually zoom in pretty far to see, see the structures here. It's actually higher resolution than, this, than the CT data. Back out here. Beside that is other features that were detected. So the average CT number is just the horizontal average of the, uh, of the CT intensity or attenuation coefficient that was computed. Beside that is the CT histogram. So every 10 slices of CT data, we count up all the uh, CT numbers there and do a histogram of that. And that gives you an idea of the distribution of material that's within that, that small section. And uh, can, this is very useful for analysis and for features for uh, machine learning algorithms. The cylinder unwrap is an interesting view. So the cylinder unwrap is basically an extraction of all the CT values around uh, a specified circumference within the core. And it's unwrapped and displayed in two dimensions. And this is useful for comparing with borehole images. Uh, if you want to align it so that the core is in the same alignment it was when it was in the ground. Next is a view of the high density projection. So this, you can almost imagine if you take the three-dimensional core and make it somewhat translucent and shine a light through it, it's sort of illuminating the higher density features here. So I've actually zeroed in on this part of the core because it's interesting. You can see there's a lot of stuff going on here. And I'll, I'm going to bring up a 3D view in a moment and show you more of that detail. And then the local binary pattern and the local binary pattern histogram, these are measures of texture. These are, are computed uh, from the libraries from scikit-image and can be used for 
uh, features if you're looking for various rock fabrics. Curve showing the dip angle, the lamina, and then um, well logs that um, I've imported as well. So these are XRF data, just measuring the percentage of various, of various elements, and also uh, uh, a density curve from, a, from an instrument that was put down the borehole. So I mentioned that this section of the core kind of looks interesting in here. And these are all two-dimensional views. So I'm going to highlight this section. And it's going to go up, I'm going to go up to disk now and load up the volumetric data from that section of the core. All right, so this is our three-dimensional viewer tool. And I'm going to start out with all the parts of the core transparent. Okay, so my Avi is actually sitting here in the background providing the 3D visualization. And I have some tools to control it on the bottom here. And in particular, in this case, I'm going to pay attention to this line here. This is a histogram of all the CT numbers in the data that I've loaded up. And, uh, and everything's transparent. But what I can do is I can create a transfer window here. I'm going to give it kind of a bright lime green color. And what this is doing is illuminating the CT numbers that lie within this little envelope. Here. So as I scan it across, I can move it around, and as I scan across, I'm, I'm successfully illuminating slightly more dense uh, CT numbers. If I come over here just on the side of this peak, you can see it is making these bedding planes kind of show up. So this is relatively soft uh, material that's in uh, the bedding planes in this section. And then we have a bump here in the histogram. So this is where the rock matrix is. Most of the CT numbers lie within this range, so it's going to make everything wash out. And as I come over to the other side of this peak, I illuminate these interesting structures. These are bioturbation structures from critters that lived within this section of the rock when it was deposited, and they were burrowing around, um, you know, in the relatively shadow se sediments at the time. And this can be used by geologists to, to date the rock. They can say, they can identify the burrows that exist and uh, say, okay, I know when this critter existed, and so they, they can date them that way and also give them information about the environment that the, that the sediment was deposited in. So I can add another one of these little windows if I want to also show those bedding planes along with these to show how they, they cut across the beds. And create some interesting 3D visualizations this way. And this is one of the only tools that can actually visualize core CT data uh, in, in, the, in this manner. So a few other images we've created from cores we've seen, uh, other bioturbation structures, fractures through the rock, and then some sediment ripples on the right-hand side. And I'll note that this uh, component was created by John Wiggins. It's called Ensemble, and it's open source, and it's available on GitHub at that address. So, uh, again, the 3D part is my avi, and then the ensemble is that plus the rest of the tools that sit around it to illuminate um, uh, 3D data using those tools I showed. So I also talked about the fact that we can use machine learning algorithms for classification. So this is a screenshot of the tool we created to do this. So what this does is it allows uh, the geologists working on this to identify certain sections that might be of interest. There might be sections that create, contain some bioturbation or, or various features. They can create a feature set to describe those parts of the core and then go through and make a small number of observations for various sections, whether or not those sections contain the feature they're looking for or not. And they build up a training set in that way. And then in this case, we're using a, um, a random force classifier to go through and upscale that small description to the rest of the core so they can uh, immediately apply um, that, that description to the rest of the core, even though it might be very long. And it's iterative in the sense that they can go back later and, and refine it and make it a better description if, uh, if they're not satisfied with the results. So recently, we're pretty excited to be working with uh, Expedition 364 of the International Ocean Drilling Program. So this is a project to go and drill the peak ring of the Chicxulub impact crater in Mexico. So the peak ring is that, is that middle ring in the center there. And there aren't many preserved peak rings on Earth. Uh, I think there might be only two that they've, that they've been able to find. So that's an, that image in the top left is sort of shortly after this impact happened at the end of the Cretaceous. And it now has 500 meters of uh, carbonate sediment lying over top of it. 
And uh, this project just wrapped up drilling. It's been in the news lately, so you might have heard about it. Uh, and, the, and the core has just finished being scanned at Weatherford Labs in Houston. And uh, they've extracted 835 meters of core, which is easily 10 times more than any cores we've, we've typically dealt with. And so this is the four terabyte core that I was talking about earlier. And, uh, and they're interested in, in a lot of cool things to do with, with, this, um, uh, with this core. So they're finding granites that are uh, more porous than they, than they were expecting. And uh, they're interested in the uh, fracture geometries uh, to know the exact deformation of the Earth when one of these asteroids hits. So we're providing um, the CT data processing and the imaging capabilities and machine learning that I've showed you earlier to help out with that project. So. We don't really have any results yet. We just have uh, we processed a little bit, but um, that will be coming out in uh, in the coming weeks. So I'm not one of the developers on the project. I haven't been involved with it for about a year, and I've I've done a few uh, a few pull requests that mostly revolve around documentation. So I want to acknowledge all the tremendous work that's been done by the other developers on the project, John Wiggins and Nora Duran. Tony Yu and Pietro Burks, Mark and John have really done a lot of work on this and many others. Uh, I also want to point out uh, the efforts of Andrew Govert. Originally it was at Shell who started the project off. It was really his vision that, uh, to take this CT, da CT data and do something with it that, um, that uh, gave birth to this project and he's now at Simrex Energy. So I'm happy to take any questions. If you want any more information on Virtual Core, there's a URL there and, uh, and my email address if you'd like to have any more information. Thank you. No, what that is, is it takes the raw CT data and cleans it and, and does the initial feature detection to determine things like bedding and basically creates the, the project. And then Virtual Core reads that and displays that data in the interface I was showing and allows you to do the classification and... Okay, so if I had a refinement of this Virtual Core does not make sense. That's right. It's all sort of Virtual Core, but there's a processing step and a visualizer step. We did. Yeah, we have, so yeah, that's right. We have a depth shift editor, and what this does is uh, you can pick the depth tracks you want to align, and here I'm going to align, there's, so when you import data, you can import it on its own depth track if you want. There's like a DLIS import track, there's well log import track, and you know when they're laying these core boxes out, right, things get shifted around. So even if they think it's correct, it's still offset by a bit. And so, yeah, what this tool lets you do is manage basically a, sh a tie table that you can tie data from one to the other. So I've gone through this and manually done these ties. So if I wanted to say, okay, you know what, I think this, this part of the core is actually there, I can update the shift table and it'll, you sort of specify a parent one that will stay static and one that will get stretched. And you can do this with well log scale as well. I can just shift this to the well log to photo scale and then pick which well log scale I want to use. So there I'm showing pyrite, I could use that density scale and do it that way. The well log data is hard to do because it's very low resolution compared to the photo and the, and the well log data, so. Yeah, um, 
so I don't, uh, I don't know a whole lot more about that, but I know that you know, the, it's a pretty complex tree to go through all of the steps in the processing algorithm. So there's a core barrel detection step where we're actually determining the contiguous chunks of rock. That needs to get done. You know, we're identifying where the rock ends and the, and the core and the barrel begins and the, uh, the dependencies between those and the steps are, I think, managed with Network X, but I can definitely talk to you about that afterwards if you, if you want. So, yeah, we're just doing it now um, with the uh, Mexico Impact Core. So there's a bunch of carbonate sediment on top, and then granite, weird granite, all the way down. So uh, we haven't got that data yet, but I'm interested to see what it looks like because its density signature is going to be very different from the soft rock. So. Yeah, the, so the tool to actually do that visualization is called Ensemble. And uh, I can give you the link to it right after we're done. It's on GitHub. And, uh, but I mean, my obvious there doing the 3D visualization. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can bring in resistivity logs. Yep. Yep, that's right. And so, um, what I'm excited about with this is now that you have this digital model of the core, the machine learning possibilities are huge. The upscaling, you know, things you can do with that are, are very interesting. And so, you know, we've had a few projects looking into the ability to do that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone.